good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us today to discuss what I consider to be one of the greatest challenges of our generation, amongst other challenges, um, ensuring financial well-being at a time when the realities of how we are working, living, spending, playing are changing. I am Adrita Bhattacharya Craven. I lead the health and aging research at the Geneva Association and I will be speaking and moderating the webinar today. I am joined by my co-author, Richard Jackson, president of the Global Aging Institute, an internationally recognized authority on population aging. He has written numerous policy studies and the challenges it poses. We also have with us Tyler Bradshaw, vice president of financial wellness programming within the financial wellness and engagement practice at MetLife. Tyler leads the whole intellectual engine that powers Upwise, which is MetLife's new financial wellness digital solution. And last but not the least, we have Lucy Standing. Lucy is a founder of Brave Starts, an organization helping people as they get older to figure out what they would like to do next. She is an expert in the field of mid and later life career development, and Brave Starts has become the platform to generate the research and evidence needed to make that real. A very warm well welcome to you all, and it's great to have you here. In terms of the structure of the webinar, uh, the webinar is divided into two parts. Richard and I will take turns to share with you the key messages from our report. It's available on our website if you haven't seen it already, um, and you can see an image on the slide. Following this, we will be bringing you some practical examples of innovations that are taking place. And this is where Tyler and subsequently Lucy will come in. The final part is the 25 minutes of Q&A, where we would love to hear your views and take your questions, and I really look forward to your active participation. Uh, some housekeeping. During the session, you can participate in two ways. Uh, use the raise hand function to ask a live question, and we will unmute you. You can use, also use the Q&A function on the screen to submit a written question, which can be done anytime during the event. If you're faced with any technical issues, please use the chat function for technical support. With that, let's begin. And let's begin with a poll. Um, may I please ask our audience three short questions for us to gauge the level of financial well being in this virtual room today? So we have some results, and they are quite stark. 68% um, of us have had money worries. Um, only 12% of us have had have resorted to uh, or been able to access professional help to be able to talk about this openly. And about, uh, a th this is like a, 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 an answer divided up in thirds, basically, a third of us roughly feel that you have enough to see you through old age and your life. A third of us don't feel that we have enough, and a third of us are not sure. So this is a case in point about the problem that we are going to discuss today. Financial well-being is more common than we think. It is not a problem out there. It is our problem too. Uh, and we, we don't have the support we would like to have, and we are potentially walking into a, a crisis. Now imagine this happening at a much bigger scale. And imagine this happening in the context of insurance and being able to revisit the core functions of insurance to see how the insurance industry uh, and what they can do to, to address this problem. Can we move to the, the next slide, please? Uh, so financial well-being is a term familiar to some and less familiar to others. This research was an attempt to bring the full picture together and, and put an insurance lens on it. Next slide, please. So what is driving this emerging concept? Just to contextualize, contextualize a little bit, a lot is happening because of aging and also the way we are aging and the realities around us that's affecting the process. Longevity is now a certainty, not a risk for most. By the turn of the century, people will live to be anything between 80 and 100, depending on where we are in this world and whose projections we go by. But our attitudes regarding who is young, old, working age, retired hasn't changed. 
And this will have implications for a number of policy areas, including financial security. And life insurers are at the forefront of this crisis. We are carrying the risk of longevity while we are also trying to fill the various macroeconomic and other headwinds. Next slide, please. Our report defines financial well-being as a set of financial and associated non-financial needs throughout an individual's life course to meet ongoing financial obligations and future aspirations. And as you can see, these needs are on the different layers on this diagram on the right hand side of the slide, which I have endearingly called my onion. It starts with financial literacy at the very core of it, and then it progresses to everyday occurrence, then future planning, personal well being, and overall risk management. As we have this discussion, I would like you to bear this image in your mind and then a lot of that what we'll be talking about will start to make sense next slide please what did we set out to do this is a slide on our objectives and methodology i think they're fairly self-explanatory we start by looking at the drivers that are changing the future of financial well-being and then we go into some we go into discussing uh, some of these drivers later and then we start looking at, you know, how life insurers are currently reacting to this and what more they can do in the future. With that, let's begin. Let's move on to the next slide. Richard, let's begin with you. Um, there are long held ideas about retirement, when we retire, how we retire, with what we retire. Can you tell us a little bit more about how these patterns of retirement is changing. Thank you. Richard, you may be on mute. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to take a stab at it, Adrita. Um, I, I think the place to start is to understand that that around the world, traditional retirement institutions um, are, are under stress. Almost everywhere, retirement insecurity is growing. And along with it, the need for broadening and deepening long-term savings and insurance coverage. And the challenge for the industry really is to adapt to the new um, emerging uh, demographic, economic, and social realities. In the developed world, um, what we might look back on is the golden age of retirement is now coming to an end. You know, back in the early post-war decades, starting in the 1950s and 60s, when the workforce and wages were growing rapidly and retirees were relatively scarce, most developed countries put in place generous state retirement systems, mostly on a pay-as-you-go basis. Um, Along uh, with these systems, and in some countries, the expansion uh, of, of private pension coverage, there was a dramatic transformation in the social and economic status of the elderly. As recently as the 1960s, the poverty rate of the elderly in the United States was three times that of younger adults. Today, the poverty rate of the elderly is actually lower than that of younger adults. But the prospects for future retirees are not so bright. As populations have begun to age, due both to rising life expectancy and falling birth rates, and as economic growth has slowed, governments have been forced um, to reduce the future prospective generosity of state retirement provision. Most are raising retirement ages. Some have cut benefit levels or re-indexed benefits and current uh, payment status. Um, some, including Sweden and Italy uh, and Germany and Japan, have even through various mechanisms effectively indexed their state pension systems to both demographic and economic change. Um, the result is growing retirement insecurity uh, uh, in some countries, the cuts in the, the cuts in benefits have been truly enormous. In, in South Korea, which had the bad timing to introduce its pay-as-you-go state pension system in 1988, 
just before its birth rate collapsed. Um, replacement rates have already been cut twice from the original 70% to 40% um, and may need to be cut further in the future since the system is still running long-term deficits. In the emerging world, um, there's even greater cause for concern. Here, the problem is not so much that the generosity of retirement systems is being reduced, though in some countries it is, rather it's that in economies with large informal sectors, the reach of these state pension systems is limited. The effective coverage rate in Latin America uh, is only around 50%. In some Asian countries, it's only between 10 and 15%. Up to now, workers who have arrived in old age without a pension or without adequate savings have been able to rely on their grown children and extended family for support in old age. But family size is declining um, and the forces of moder modernization, urbanization, industrialization, um, and the spread of more individualistic Western values, if you will, uh, is undermining the role of the, of the family. Um, so in the face of an erosion in these two traditional pillars of retirement support, government on the one hand in the developed world um, and the family on the other hand in emerging markets, there really are only two responses. There are only two ways um, to improve retirement security without putting an additional and unsustainable burden on government or families. Um, the one is to save more <laughs> throughout the course uh, of, of, of working lives. And here there's some real progress being made. Uh, in the developed world, of course, some countries, uh, the, U the UK, the United States, the Netherlands, Switzerland, um, have always had um, a solid funded uh, a pillar um, as part of their overall retirement system. But even in countries like, like Germany or Korea or Japan um, that have traditionally relied almost exclusively on pay-as-you-go retirement coverage, efforts are underway, um, of efforts are underway to broaden and deepen uh, funded retirement systems. The same is true in the emerging world. Um, and, and here actually developments are especially encouraging. Many countries uh, which have failed to expand state pension coverage to the informal sector uh, are now um, making efforts and often successful efforts to extend voluntary retirement savings to the informal sector by leveraging um, um, recent developments in financial inclusion and in digital IT um, and in national ID systems. But despite these successes um, in the developed world, notably in the UK and New Zealand in expanding pension coverage and emerging markets, notably in India and China, um, there are still large gaps in coverage. And even for those who are covered, savings is also is often inadequate. One statistic for you, in the United States, the median 401k balance in 2020 was $26,000, which is less than half of the median household income. Even for people aged 55 to 64, the median balance was only around 70,000. Um, so expand savings. Number two, work longer. And here there's been some progress as well, at least in the developed world. You know, between the 1950s and the 1990s, um, elderly labor force participation plunged just about everywhere. Uh, since then, it's reversed course, nearly doubling in the United States, um, and especially not so much age 65 and over, but in the late 50s and early 60s, um, doubling, tripling, or even quadrupling in some European countries. What's driving this? Well, part of it is the retrenchment in state retirement provision. Um, um, normal or full benefit retirement ages are being raised, early retirement options are being curtailed, but there's also a deeper story here. Um, in recent decades, what had been a yawning gap in educational 
attainment uh, between younger and older uh, uh, adults has closed. The economy has changed in ways that put less of a premium on physical vigor. There's a generational reevaluation underway um, of the pros and cons uh, of all or nothing retirement versus continued engagement. So let me just end uh, uh, this section of my remarks with three thoughts. Um, the importance of long-term retirement savings will continue to grow um, along with the erosion of these traditional pillars of retirement support, rising life expectancy and delayed retirement will give that a further push. <clears throat> there is likely to be an increased demand uh, for um, products that turn uh, a lump, lump sum retirement balances into income streams, um, and there will also be increasing demand for more flexible long-term savings products as people move beyond this three box life cycle of education, work and retirement and partial retirement, phased retirement and unretirement all grow in importance. Thank you very much. That was really very uh, insightful. Um, let me uh, pick up another point with you, uh, Richard. Perhaps it is also fair to say that it is not just the patterns of retirement that are changing for all the reasons that you have just outlined, but there are some bigger economic forces at play here, right? Can you tell them a little bit about those? Yeah, and, and very, very briefly, um, I would highlight three. First, we face a future uh, of continuously slowing economic growth. <clears throat> Falling fertility translates into slower growth in the working age population, which translates into slower growth in employment, which in turn translates into slower GDP growth. Um, by the 2030s, uh, populations in Japan and some faster aging European countries, working age populations that is, will be contracting by between one and one and a half percent per year. Unless productivity rises at least as fast as employment falls, um, we could be looking uh, uh, at zero GDP growth across the business cycle, secular stagnation. A surge in productivity uh, could help to solve that problem, but there are reasons to think that in aging societies, productivity is more likely to fall than rise. Um, investment demand, uh, uh, rates of investment fall as workforces grow more slowly and there's less need for capital broadening investment. Um, the average age of the workforce will also be rising, uh, which may make it less uh, mobile, less dynamic, um, less innovative. Older workers uh, 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 bring a lot to the table, um, but they're not necessarily perfect substitutes for younger work workers, especially in eras of rapid technological change. Second point, um, we are likely, uh, and, and note that I say likely, to face uh, an era of continued low interest rates. The first order effect of population aging on interest rates is to pull them down. Um, and, and that operates through the impact of slower growth in the working age population and employment um, on, on economic growth, uh, slack investment demand. Um, so far, that first order effect is utterly and completely dominated. <laughs> investment demand is slack, the world is awash in excess savings um, from a macro perspective. Uh, uh, but there's also uh, the possibility that the other shoe falls. Um, and this second order effect operates through the shift in the age structure of the population. As more people enter the retirement years, the harvest years in decades to come, um, it's possible that this will pull savings down and push interest rates back up. Um, the third uh, point that I highlight uh, is growing labor force informality. You know, in, in emerging markets for a long time, economists assumed that along with development, formality would increase and as formality increased, so would, uh, uh, so would coverage under social insurance systems 
uh, basically solving the income security and retirement security problem, but it hasn't worked out that way. Um, informality has not uh, declined along with development. In fact, it's grown in some countries, especially, uh, especially in Asia. Meanwhile, in the developed world, um, we have the emergence of two-tiered labor markets and a rapidly growing gig economy um, um, where income is uncertain and benefits are all often, uh, traditional employ employer benefits are often uh, uh, lacking, in, lacking entirely. All of this complicates um, the uh, task of maintaining financial and improving financial well-being not just in retirement, but across the life cycle. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thanks very much. So those were the first two drivers uh, that we discussed. There are two more, and let me talk you through very quickly the, the other two and, and some additional insights from the report. Let's move on to the next slide, please. So the other two drivers that I want to talk you through um, are health and, and technology. Let's, let's start with the with the health. So health needs and healthcare costs are rising. They are putting further pressure on people's ability to work and the public and private resources needed to keep them healthy and productive. This is largely a result of rising chronic illnesses among the, today's elderly, but as well as the young. So the picture for tomorrow's elderly is not necessarily a very good one. The chart that you see on the left elaborates this case of healthy versus unhealthy aging using a study that uh, took place in Japan. It looks at three scenarios. The current scenario, if everything remained the same, the case of premature uh, morbidity, um, and the case of healthy aging policies and what difference that makes to per capita health spending. And we can see a very notable difference. Now, I ask you to keep this in mind, because the question is, how do we then arrest the accumulation of comorbidities as we age? So we can be doing more interesting things with our lives, such as working longer and doing work that we would really like to do as we um, think about longer working lives. Um, we also see a vicious cycle. Uh, not only do we see that aging and chronic illnesses strengthening the case for greater financial well-being, we also see that being financially unwell is leading to poor physical and mental health and unproductive aging. That is basically suppressing people's capacity to save. Next slide, please. Finally, we come to the, our, uh, our driver, which is technology. Um, the core audience is changing for life insurers. Life insurers has been typically targeting baby boomers until now. Uh, and now they will have to target the millennials and the Gen Z who are brought up with technology. Some are being successful in the US, uh, life insurance companies with digital capacity and algorithm driven underwriting experienced a 30 to 50% increase in sale from young people during the COVID-19 pandemic. But I would say at the industry level, the evidence suggests that the most are lagging behind with technology or certainly using it in a way which is very narrow in its focus and that risks undermining areas such as financial inclusion or really meaningful consumer engagement, which is critical for financial well-being. And this vacuum is creating a whole new breed of digital platforms that is something called HTech that sits somewhere between fintech and health tech. HTEC venture funding alone is estimated to have increased tenfold since 2011. It stands at a, about a billion dollars right now. But this is just one estimate. There are other wild estimates out there, suggesting basically that this is uh, a, an industry poised to make the most of the longevity economy. The graph on the left illustrates this change in core audience. It is from the US that shows that during the pandemic, how life insurance applications have risen for the, from those aged at 45 and below. There is evidence a lot of these searches were initiated online. And a lot of the products that were bought were risk-based products because people were feeling quite a bit vulnerable at that point. So how can then did this momentum be translated to the savings-oriented products for life insurance? And that is the biggest challenge because that is the biggest chunk of life insurance. So that then leads us to the next slide, uh, which is, so what for insurance? 
we know the current state of play in life insurance, uh, so I won't go over them, but that's just um, uh, illustrated in the chart that you see on the screen. And what are life insurance doing about it? The next slide, please. So this is the survey part of our research that reflects what life, how life insurers rather are interpreting financial well-being and how are they responding to these new circumstances. So on the left, you can see who was involved and what their involvement really means. Uh, and on the right, you can see some of the key messages. I won't go over all of them, but just highlight some of the critical ones that really stand out. So financial well-being is seen as a comprehensive set of needs by the vast majority of insurers we survey, but their focus remains on retirement and risk protection. So there is a gap between what is acknowledged as financial well-being versus what is offered as a solution by the industry to address financial well-being. The second important part, point is demographic shift. Almost everybody said demographic shift was seen as the key driver um, to, to, for, for, for this new concept. That is why everything is changing. But they are doing relatively little about it. And I'll get to that in, on the fourth bullet. One of the many noteworthy findings was also that still relatively little is happening in the space of preventing risks of poor financial behavior or other behaviors that can lead to poor financial health. For instance, poor savings habit, addressing poor health that leads to periods of unproductivity. Uh, people drawing down pensions and savings too fast. We know uh, that these things happen. We can see it through the data, but are we doing enough with it? And then going back to the, the, uh, the point I made before um, is the demographic shifts. We see still a relatively little focus on the young or the old when it comes to products that are out there. Vast majority are still focusing on the traditional, on the traditional working age population. And it would be fair to say generally there was an acknowledgement that there is a way to go, still quite a way to go. The final slide, please. So what can insurers do differently? And we have four suggestions. Financial well-being is an ecosystem of consumer needs that goes beyond the traditional products that life insurers have offered. Insurers are definitely innovating, um, and it's important to acknowledge that. They are coming up with flexible, short-term propositions like the ones we see for, say, young workers, gig workers, critical care, care areas like cancer. But they need to match this with a long-term vision or balances with a long-term vision regarding how they fit into that whole onion constellation. That does mean that life insurers have to slightly step out of their comfort zone and start dealing with things such as uh, financial literacy, uh, engaging with governments, uh, talking about all of this with their wealth advisor, the asset managers, the financial advisors that people use when they talk about pension and retirement. Second thing is focus on the young and think of financial literacy more broadly than just about retirement. Otherwise, the danger is, like Richard talked about the labor market, there were more people will enter the labor market with very little or no idea about their financial well-being. And that is a really risky place to be. Thirdly, focus on risk prevention. We have the data. We need to use it to shift this, uh, our focus from what is currently a repair and replace to a predict and prevent. And finally, focus on the longevity economy. Don't drop off consumers as soon as they retire or they're about to retire. Retirees may live 20, 25 years beyond retirement age. Uh, they are already one of the biggest segments of the global population. We have more people over the age of 65 than we have children under the age of five but we are not doing enough. But if we do enough and we manage this transition well, this can be a tremendous source of prosperity and growth, but more innovation is needed. With that, let me wrap up the report section of our presentation and bring you some practical examples of what's going on in this world. Tyler, let me start with you. We live in a world where just over a third of people feel comfortable talking about money worries. We've seen in the poll, only 12% of our audience have been able to access any kind of professional help to actually think about these worries more constructively. As a, a, a big global insurer, how are you addressing this problem? <laughs> Thank you, Adrita. Great question. 
And despite the reluctance for most to talk openly about their finances, we know from our research that those money worries that you mentioned run really deep. And now more than ever, as financial stress continues to affect workplace performance, we also know that employers are looking for financial wellness solutions to help support their employees. And findings from our Employee Benefits Trends Study remind us why this work is so important. So just a few more data points to add. We know that financial concerns continue to be the number one cause of stress amongst employees. In fact, our reporting captures that roughly nine out of 10 employees say personal finances are a top source of stress in their daily lives. And we also know that financial and mentally healthy employees are almost 40% more likely to be productive than those who aren't. And it's safe to say that here in the US, the uncertainty in the economic environment, including rising inflation and interest rates, declining equity markets, and fear over a looming recession have only increased those anxiety levels. <clears throat> so Adrita, your question is, how are we addressing this? So there's a lot happening in the space across MetLife. And for today's conversation, I'd like to spotlight one of the more recent additions to our financial wellness portfolio, Upwise, which is our new digital financial wellness solution. And we launched Upwise last year in response to feedback from our customers and rigorous research and user testing, all of which pointed us in a similar direction to the report findings that we're talking about today. And these highlighted the significant opportunity to leverage technology to completely reimagine our relationship with our customers and the role as their benefits provider. So a little bit more about Upwise. It's designed to engage users in a different way than traditional financial wellness apps. It focuses on emotions first, dollars second, and supports users with personalized guidance so they can get the most out of every dollar, build healthy habits, and make financial progress that feels good. So specifically to those money worries, there's a couple things I just wanna mention. First and foremost, it's free to use and available to everyone in the US. So it's highly accessible and inclusive. Secondly, it's a holistic solution that addresses the full range of financial wellness needs. So we're covering everything from budgeting to saving to managing debt, family matters, preparing for the unexpected, which includes insurance and workplace benefits, and investing for the future, including retirement, along with all the emotional components that go along with each. And lastly, it's a highly personalized experience. So it's unique to each user and content is served based on their stated interests, goals, and aspirations. And that's all driven by AI and data science. So beyond those features, Adrita, we also have a deliberate strategy to deliver content within the app that speaks to the specific money management needs and nuances across the diverse employee populations that we serve, including women, people of color, and members of the LGBTQ community. So by starting with emotions and leading with empathy, we believe that we'll be able to engage users and their families in a different way, meet them where they are in their financial journey and establish deep relationships that will extend through their lifetime. Um, uh, Tyler, thank you very much. That was uh, that sort of brought to life about what Upwise really is and what it's trying to do. Um, let's let's link all of what you have just said with the with the report a little. And uh, having read the report, uh, what resonated with you the most about what insurers can do? Um, uh, any particular recommendations that really is, uh, stood out to you? Um, uh, and and if I may, uh, one area that we, we have struggled with when struggled with when doing this research was just the volume of products that are out there, <laughs> and uh, you know, and and what do we what do we yeah. do? We have a problem. We are just putting a product out in the market, and you you know, and being the devil's advocate, then you have upwise. Can you tell us? It's like there's upwise, but then how are you taking this 360 degree view of the whole person? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Adrita. That, that, it's an interesting question. And there's, there's, first of all, there's a lot to take from the report. So um, 
thank you and to the Geneva Association for including MetLife and for allowing us to participate in the survey as well as the, the panel discussion today. Um, Look, you can say MetLife's been in the financial wellness business for over 100 years because workplace benefits like life, disability, HSAs, voluntary products, all of those form such an important foundation for financial health. But that connection isn't always clear to our consumers. In fact, um, even uh, in other reporting, for example, the Financial Health Network, they produce each year a Pulse Report, um, last year's study, uh, shows that confidence in insurance coverage continues to score as one of the lowest financial health indicators in the U.S. So that's a problem, and more products aren't necessarily the solution, Adrita, as, as you mentioned. So in our view, the biggest opportunity for insurers to address this is through engagement. So we know consumers are seeking personalized experiences in their path for achieving financial health Insurers have the opportunity through tailored insights and education to guide users through that journey based on their specific goals and aspirations. And through that education and engagement, in insurers can actually better demonstrate the value of their protection products and services in the context of consumers' financial health journey and customize that guidance over time and evolve it as their needs and circumstances evolve. So this should not only help with driving for purchase of insurance products, but also drive benefit utilization and ultimately persistency as well. So for example, the value of life insurance in the context of financial wellness takes on a whole new meaning when it's presented in relation to someone's values, their specific financial goals, their balance sheet, and their family situation versus say the guidance of simply covering X times your annual salary. In our experience, Adrita, consumers are not looking for additional protection products. They're seeking out insurance solutions that fit their lifestyle, fit their budget, and sync up with their specific financial plans. So that 360 degree view that you mentioned, that's what we're building with Upwise. And by covering the basics through money management services, like budgeting, spending, saving, borrowing, and planning, we have the opportunity to connect with consumers in a much different way, expand our presence beyond covering just the catastrophic events like death and disability, and become much more relevant in their day-to-day -day financial lives. So we're shooting for engagement throughout the year versus say just during the annual benefits enrollment period. And we're aspiring for engagement throughout their lives versus just the, the current plan period. So that's how we're thinking about that, Adria. Thank you very much, Tyler. Um, very insightful. I'm sure there will be questions about it and I can see some coming and already we'll get to that in a, in a short while. So then finally, we go to Lucy. Lucy, um, we highlight the concept of silver sabbatical uh, in our report. Basically, the idea that a 50 year old is now potentially looking at another 25 years of working life and they might want to do things differently as they prolong their working lives. They might to go back and reskill. Um, can you then tell us a little bit about Brave Start? What is this all about? How it speaks to the silver sabbatical concept? And basically some of the, the research um, findings, uh, which reflects a little bit of the attitude towards work and retirement from, uh, from this 50 plus cohort. Over to you, Lucy. Yeah, I certainly can and really appreciate the opportunity to talk about an area that is critically important uh, for us as a society. Um, I am fairly confident nobody knows who Brave Starts is. So indulge me for a moment, just to give you some context. We're a nonprofit organization run by volunteers, and we support people primarily who are over the age of 50 to think about what it is that they are going to do that will enable them to extend their working lives. Um, we are a community organization, so we've got just over two and a half thousand subscribers and people who engage with our events and over 500 members who are I guess more the kind of core people within the organization who are more frequently going through our programs and courses and things. It is through that evidence that I kind of talk to you today. Um, we are, this is a field. So if we look at this field of kind of career advice and guidance, it is unfortunately a field which is run amok 
with people who are, I, for want of a better word, very, very well intentioned, but in a, in a lot of the time might actually provide misguided advice. So it is, it is an industry that we want to challenge to a degree, and we do that through providing a strong evidence base behind everything that we do. Um, part of that is researching this community, understanding it, doing pre and post measures, and wanting to really lay, raise the standards of the profession. Um, the research that we did last year um, is available on our website for free. I would encourage everyone to download that and actually learn from it. And what, what the research was really trying to understand is well, what are the factors that might be driving people at this stage in their lives and what are the barriers preventing them from achieving their maximum potential? So the first question we asked then was, well, you know, what are the what are the things that are really driving you at this stage in your life? Not quite there yet. That's the that's the barrier slide. Um, but the main factors that are really driving people, I, I imagine most people can probably relate to this. When you get older, people want to see a greater sense of purpose in their lives. That that was indicated by about 60 percent of people. And this is a survey now still ongoing. This is now six and a half thousand people have completed this. So greater sense of purpose is top. They need more flexibility. So that's that's a strong need expressed by 44 percent of people. But the other really key thing is that people get bored. 20 or 30 years of any kind of career is enough to tell people what they possibly no longer want to do, or maybe it is enough for them, but maybe they just need a bit more variety. Maybe they want to explore, they want to learn new things. Um, and that was expressed by 43% of people. Um, interestingly, we asked people about whether or not more money um, and find, you know, ha having, or well, being able to earn a larger pot was important to them. That was important to 19% of the 6,000 people. Um, and this, I think, really reflects what, what we understand in the psychology world of being the sort of shift in values and how they change over time. You know, when we're younger, and this is generalizable research, I, I'd say the main person, if you're interested in it, have a look at the work of Shalom Schwartz. He's done over 220 studies across 80 countries. And I can generalize and say um, that as we get older, we do become less preoccupied with our own strivings and we become more concerned about the welfare of others. I mean, what a gift this demographic brings to the, to the world of work. Um, and the reason that we become like that is because we age. So again, unique, so humans are unique as a species in the sense that we recognize the passing of time. And as we get older, we realize we have less time left. And as a consequence, we care more about how we spend that time. We are less tolerant of what we no longer want to do. So it is inevitable, therefore, that people want to sit, make more changes, that we want to do things that make us feel we're leaving a legacy, um, that, that we want to kind of create a, a past that we can be proud of. Um, and that, I guess, has implications for the world of finance and insurance, right? So if people at this stage in their life are going to do anything like move jobs, change homes, go and do something that has some sort of financial implication, then this is why this period in life is critically important. Um, so I get the next question we asked people was, well, we understand something now about what's driving you, but what is stopping you from achieving your key potential? And this is the slide then, if you wouldn't mind just bringing that back up for a second. Um, I, the reason I shared this slide with you is because I think it's really visually quite stark. So, you know, the main problems, people always think, well, is it, is it that I don't have the finance to do it? Is it that I don't have the support around me? The biggest factor, and look at how significant that is. So this is 74% of people, they want to work, they want to make a contribution. The problem they have is they have absolutely no idea what it is they want to do next. And that, that in itself, if you don't have clarity, you become paralyzed. Um, and that paralysis, I imagine, is going to be an issue for people who are wanting to sell and provide insurance and financial well-being products, because people can only move forward when they've got a real clear idea of what it is they're gonna do next. You'll also see that ageism is clearly an issue. Um, it, that's experienced by about 41% of people and it's overt. You know, people are quite happy at this stage to say to people, we, we literally don't want you because you're too old, you're overqualified. Um, and that's when it's overt. I mean, I think a lot of it is actually, you know, people are careful enough, maybe perhaps not to say, we don't want you because you're too old, um, but it's certainly experienced and felt. 
um, you'll see also that there is that point about being financially trapped. And that's, again, related to organizational structures, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, and the fact that people cannot find um, opportunities to do work that gives them the flexibility they need. You know, a lot of the time people have got caring issues um, or indeed they just simply want a chance to learn something new. And that's, that's what's driving that need for flexibility. Um, I think we can kind of close that slide down now. Yeah, so I, I think those are the sort of the main things that I wanted to kind of get across from the research and sort of share that perspective with you. Thank you uh, um, very much, Lucy. I think there's a plenty of food for thought there um, in terms of both uh, as an employer um, as well as uh, as an insurer or, uh, and what you can do uh, under these circumstances. Um, no, you, you talked about the opportunities and motivations, also the barriers. Um, now you are talking to a bunch of people uh, in insurance or related to insurance. Can you give us a sense about what you see as solutions that can potentially come from the industry? Yeah, um, I think first and foremost, I would encourage all of us to actually ditch the language of retirement, because I think it's it, the assumption that I think a lot of the assumption, a lot of the language is we are saving for a period of retirement. And I would suggest that that assumption would should need to be challenged. Um, certainly the evidence would say that people who are working and doing something that they enjoy is actually the goal. So the point about saving and the point about financial vehicles should be that we are then able to work in a capacity and in a manner that suits us. And this is that time in our lives where that becomes crucially and vitally important. We care more about this, as I say now, than we did when we were in our 20s, where we've got nothing, fine. We'll compromise a little bit because we need to put that roof over our head. But now at this stage in our lives, no, we're, we're less willing to compromise. So at first and foremost, I would ditch the language about retirement. The aspiration, as I say, is about enabling our lives to do the work that we want to do. The second thing I would say is you have to start with your own front door. Right. I have been looking and I'm searching for organizations who are doing innovative and clever things to really engage, target and enable people over the age of 50 to achieve their full potential. And I will tell you that the examples are lacking. The insurance industry that are wanting to serve this client base aren't even doing it within their own front door. You know, there are more things that people could be doing internally to enable people out of this demographic to achieve their full potential. Um, some of the sorts of examples around that, you know, I've heard language saying things like, well, we can't allow, if we allow people at this age to kind of go part time, or if we allow a bit more flexible working, or problems with headcount, HR systems won't support it. And it, it baffles me that we can work in an era where we are slaves to the needs of an HR system, and we're not creating HR systems that serve the needs of the humans they're actually working for. So I think, I think there's an awful lot more companies need to do, specifically around that enabling flexibility, enabling periods of reskilling, celebrating the people who, if they're no longer working five days a week, but doing this phased retirement, actually sort of saying, well, you know, here's George, here's Sheila, here's Jack, and they're actually writing a book or they're working for a charity one day a week, or you know what, they're just developing their hobby or they're actually doing some physical exercise. And that's a brilliant, brilliant thing for them. And that's what we want to encourage. Um, and I would suggest that the more that you do that, the more that you keep people, because it's, it's that which is driving people away is when they can't get those sorts of things. Um, the last couple of things I would say is, you know, you've already pointed out in the report very, very astutely, the language around um, dropping terms like formal workplaces. You know, the people in our cohorts, if we look, you know, we supported more than 120 people to kind of find what, for want of a better word, their dream job. Um, and it is a portfolio based future. It is a it is a future that lacks formal work structure. So products and services need to be designed with that kind of flexibility of language that your report is pointing out. Um, and then the last thing I would say is you should possibly think about, you know, when you're talking about financial planning and financial products, it cannot be done in isolation without thinking about, well, what is this biggest problem? How do we solve that problem of making people clearer about their future? You know, we've had people who've 
when they're paralyzed and say, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do next. They don't move, they don't do anything, they don't purchase, they don't be found, they don't do these things. Once they realize, yes, I do want to do that. I, I'm now gonna move house. I mean, a, a best example is someone who's literally moved countries, bought a factory and now manufactures leather goods as opposed to working as an accountant. But the majority of people that we work with actually sort of go, well, I thought I wanted to be a teacher. I thought I wanted to do this. I thought I wanted to be a musician. Actually, in reality, I don't want that. In reality, I just need more flexibility. I want to work three or four days a week. And I want to spend a bit more time playing golf, seeing my friends, spending time with grandchildren, doing a bit of a degree on the side and learning a bit more. So that's pretty much, those are the kind of my top suggestions for now. You see uh, plenty going on there, both in terms of what uh, insurers can do as employers, but also when thinking about their products and services. With that, let's open this up for our uh, audience. And a few questions have come in. I will start with the, with the first one that was sent to us. Um, this perhaps is a question I will address to Tyler, if I may, uh, and, uh, and if others want to come in, please let me know. So this is a question from Marcin Kowinski. Please forgive me if I have uh, pronounced your name wrong. You can correct me later. The question is, how do you assess the potential role of open finance, finance especially in tracking present financial behaviors? Tyler, do you want to have a go at this? Sure. Thank you, Adrita. I'm not sure exactly what um, what we're suggesting here with uh, in regards to open finance, but um, what I will say is that through the Upwise experience, what we're looking to do is is make sure that we can monitor the activity that's taking place within the app. Um, that's all important feedback for us and signals that feeds into our machine learning model. So. Back to our intention of creating a, a personalized experience and customized insights, monitoring that activity is really important to us. We also provide the option for a user to link their financial accounts um, so that we can provide additional insights that go much deeper based on trends and activity levels that we see. Uh, so that's been our approach for that so far, Adrita. Thank you. Um Richard, would you would you have anything to add here? Um, on uh, the question of open finance, uh, no, um, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think you put that quite well, Tyler. I, 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 I would just take half a minute to stress one point that I don't think we've quite hammered uh, as much as we should. And, and, and that's that when we look at the issue of financial well-being, um, even if we're looking at it at different points in people's lives, we're compartmentalizing those points. We, we really need to take a life cycle perspective. So if you're concerned about the health of the elderly 10 or 15 or 25 years from now, you should be looking at improving the health of midlife adults. If you're concerned about the health of the elderly 40, 50, 60 years from now, you should be making investments in the health of children. And, and, and the same is true on, on the financial side. The, the single most important thing we could do to boost financial well-being across the life cycle would be to make larger and more effective investments in financial education at young ages, um, a point you made, Adrita. Um, you know, there are a number of efforts in this regard, uh, uh, one by, uh, uh, sponsored by the Prudence Foundation uh, called Kaching, which certainly bear, uh, uh, bear further examination. We need to do more on both of these fronts, working across the life cycle. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, we have another question that's come from Dana Wiley. So it's a question. So are financially secure employees more productive because they are financially secure? Or are they financially secure, uh, sorry, or, or are they financially secure because they are productive employees and thus rewarded better by the company? So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg. And I wondered, uh, perhaps I should go to Lucy. Lucy, from your work with organizations and, and people, uh, do you have any, any comments on that? And perhaps Tyler, you can come in based on some of the insights from the, from the, from the work you do with employers. 
Um, yeah, my first observation on that would be that it it is um, humans are frustratingly complicated, right? I mean, I, I find I remember being at school working in a classroom where it said on the wall, if human brains were simple to enough to understand, we would be too simple to understand them. And that unfortunately is true when it comes to planning and policies and things like that. So in the sense that there are so many factors that play a part. I've hinted to it in the chat, but for example, we know that two completely different people may have one high in terms of levels of neuroticism and anxiety will experience a higher amount of worry and concern and fear when it, but you can apply that to anything finance included. Um, but likewise, personal circumstances play a role, context plays a role, the time that you are in your life plays a role. There are, it is almost too many factors to be able to isolate it down to any one thing in particular. What I would, however, say, I mean, the guy, um, Angus Deaton won the Nobel Prize for economics for this. And, you know, what's clear is that people do need a minimum level of finance in order to be able to be productive. So, and I, you know, it was some time ago, but at the time it was indicated, certainly as far as US figures are concerned, so a figure of around 30,000 a year if you're a single, individual about 50,000 a year if you have a family. But over and above that threshold, if you're earning 100,000, 200,000, the marginal return on how much less stress you are is, is, is non-existent um, or it, it kind of disappears. So people do need a baseline, but beyond that, a lot of other factors come into play. Tyler, any comments from you? Yeah, thanks, Adrita. I, I think Lucy did a really nice job covering it. I mean, I'll just add from our research, we also see a connection to not only just productivity, but also to loyalty and to satisfaction for the workplace as well, at least in situations where employers are supporting their employees with, with efforts and services and capabilities that help improve financial wellness and financial health. And, um, you know, Bloomberg actually recently uh, published an article that that talks about how uh, through some of their findings, a third of of um, individuals in the U.S. who are earning two hundred fifty thousand dollars are living paycheck paycheck to paycheck. So I think we also have to be mindful that um, you know the concept of stress really is applying to the vast majority of of employees right now, and um, this is becoming a, a more and more important issue at the work site. the same again. Um, uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Tyler. Um, uh, Lucy, uh, a question from, I believe it's uh, Susan Krogmeyer. Uh, she asks, Lucy, do you see a solution for flex flexible HR system as work uh, as something that could work for earlier stages of the work career when potentially family and children cause people to drop out of workforce? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, if we're, again, if we're thinking about this as a solution, as a financial product, um, you know, given that people are going to experience multiple careers over the course of their life, you know, needing to take time could be your late 20s, could be your mid 40s. Deciding what that time is for is a, is, is a value to people at any stage in their lives. I would say it's where I think we, we kind of observe there's more a sense of urgency as people hit 50, but you know, in their mid thirties, people who are having children want to have it. People who've made mistakes with their careers and they're thinking, yikes, I definitely don't want to carry down this part. I'm gonna to have to maybe do another two years at some time in my twenties. Without a shadow of a doubt, whilst it's a need for people in their fifties, it's a huge benefit for people at any stages in their lives. You know, and if we if we give up this traditional concept of retirement and we see that we basically will work pretty much forever, those we need to punctuate. We almost need to take that retirement piece and punctuate it throughout our working lives so that we can experience almost a bit of retirement in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and so on. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, we have a, a number of questions coming in. Uh, Lucy, which I will read out, uh, but I also want to remind our, our audience that uh, you don't always have to type in. If you just want to raise your hand, I will unmute you and you can speak to the panelists uh, directly. But uh, while that happens, let me uh, go to Jane Wang. Um, and perhaps this is a question I can tackle, uh, or Richard, if you if you want to come in from what we highlighted the report as well. So what are some of the best wealth, financial wellness solutions today? Anything similar to Upwise? 
Um, I think uh, th there, there are a number. Um, I mean, we, we are a think tank. We don't critique uh, applications, um, but uh, we, we just need to uh, we critique what they are trying to address. But in the, uh, in the report, um, if, you, if you go through, we have been very cognizant that we, whatever we do, we need to back this up with, with a real life example. And we highlight a number of these uh, in a snapshot case example boxes. Um, uh, Upwise is one of them. You can read more about Upwise, but there are others. In the recommendation sections also, you can see a number of uh, uh, signposts there, uh, including about Brave Starts and a few others as well as to what, what's going on in the world and how people are thinking outside the box. So hopefully some of those uh, would, would help you answer that question. I don't know, Richard, do you want to add to this in any way? Well, I, I tangentially, I'd, I'd just like to second Lucy's very important point. Um, it's <clears throat> it, it's really easy to forget uh, that retirement as we as we know it as a social construct is 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 re is relatively recent. Uh, retirement actually had negative connotations in the past. Um, it was something you did to an old machine or or an old horse. <laughs> Um, we, 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 we do, we do need to move beyond that and the insurance industry um, needs to continue to think about innovative ways uh, of allowing um, what we call retirement savings to be used for perhaps more fulfilling and productive purposes. Thank you, Richard. Um, a question for Tyler um, that's come from uh, Sebastian Matteson. So, um, could be could the end of life services insurance suitable option for some people because term life insurance it is obsolete in my view that's a that's a you know a, a question so really seeing you know uh, talking about you know continuation or prolonging lives as opposed to term life um, so how are you packaging these products, I guess, is probably the question from, from Sebastian. Where do they fit in in the spectrum of life insurance in terms of the product portfolio available? Sure. I, I, I can speak to you know, how we view this, tying it back to financial wellness, Adrita. And so, so what I would say is um, you know, our perspective would be to, to educate consumers on, on what's available. And when we say it's obsolete, I would just defer that to the consumer to decide depending on their personal situation and their financial needs. So our intent through the financial literacy and the educational material that we make available to our users is just to educate them on, on what is available and the benefits um, of each of the coverage types. And um, you know, going back to the, the complexities that I think Lucy mentioned, you know, I think that um, that certainly applies to what's the right insurance coverage as well. So our approach is always just to, uh, to educate users on what's available, what the benefits are of each, and then let them decide what makes the most sense for their financial situation and their family. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Tyler. Uh, um, I have a question from Don Kanak. Uh, he asked a point, read the point about educating youth on financial literacies. Schools teach many things, but not this critical life skill. Is there any plan to follow up on this work and outreach to educators or financial policymakers to encourage them to look into formalizing financial literacy for youth? I will come to all the panelists about it because I believe you all have views around this. But let's start with Richard. Richard, what have you seen around the world in this space around financial literacy? Well, I could start with uh... I could start with my own personal experience with my three children um, in uh, uh, public schools in Fairfax County, Virginia, which is has one of the most, is a relatively affluent county, has one of the best school systems in the United States. And uh, yes, uh, there is a financial literacy course required for graduation, um, but it's in high school, uh, so it's relatively late. Um, um, it doesn't start in elementary school, it doesn't start in middle school, and it's something you can do online over the summer, um, and it, 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 it isn't graded and doesn't form part of the, the regular curriculum, and I, 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 I think that that is uh, 
unfortunately, um, all too true. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, the Prudence Foundation's Kaching program, uh, which is operating in um, um, Africa uh, and Asia, um, and and does does make uh, important investments in financial education, starting uh, where it should um, at very young ages in elementary school. Um, I'm sure there are other programs as well that other panelists could could mention as possible examples to be studied and emulated. Thank you, Richard. Why don't we go to Lucy and then to Tyler? Um, I would thoroughly agree. I, you know, for, for I mean, again, I've, I've got three children. Financial literacy and financial education is is not an assumption that we can uh, that we can say that parents will provide. Um, and if schools don't provide it, I'm not sure where the best vehicle would be to do it. You know, it's it's possibly too much of a burden to place on every single employer. And it's an easier, it is an easier option to provide it throughout a school system. So I would I would encourage and agree I, that's the place to do it in my view. Tyler, do you want to come in and tell us a little bit about what MetLife is doing in this direction? Sure. And I can just add just on the personal side, my wife is a teacher. I've got two teenage daughters. It's been fascinating to see them go through high school and take the personal finance course that is offered. Um, we're lucky that it's even offered. I know that that's not the case in, in, in many school systems. Um, you know, in this, uh, Adrita is part of the reason why we make Upwise available for free for everybody. And um, our primary audience, although we, we believe um, that this is a, a solution that everyone can see benefit out of, our primary target is younger working families based on all the research that we did. That's where we found there was the most energy and motivation um, to engage with technology to help, you know, along the path of, of uh, the journey of financial wellness. Um, but we're starting to build in content that parents can share with their kids. And we're looking at ways of creating the right gamification to introduce that into the experience as well so that we can make it fun for kids to start to learn more about how to manage money in a very age appropriate way. Um, but I think school systems are, are probably the best bet in terms of distribution and exposure and access into kids at the right time. And you know, we are certainly exploring opportunities where we can make Upwise available um, to be used in, in school systems and um, we think there's a big opportunity there. Very much, Tyler. And perhaps I would also add a, a slightly different angle here is when we were doing the research, we also became aware of the different cultural differences when we talk about financial literacy and also how insurance industry should position in it. In, in some countries, uh, there would not be an issue. Uh, in, in taking a more hands-on approach. In other countries, it may well be. And, and the recommendations that we present in the report, one of the things that we do say is that being mindful of that. And it does mean that then insurers need to start working with other people to develop these solutions, be that be governments, be that be influencers, be that be uh, community-based organizations, schools, et cetera. So making somebody else the front of this work rather than seeing this as a, some sort of a commercial interest where you're trying to go and brainwash young kids in, in school. So there is that um, element to it as well. And it's, it's just something to be mindful of. And I know some of the insurers are thinking about it already. We have come to the last five minutes of our uh, webinar. And uh, I, I want to uh, do a round of uh, the finishing touches and get a, an opinion from all of our panelists uh, um, the, the, uh, about what we have done over the past uh, six, seven months and hopefully more to come. So Richard, firstly, starting with you, you have worked with the, uh, on this report very closely with me and the GA team. Um, and what was the single most important finding for you from this report? And what would you like to see next happen? Well, um, I, I hesitate to say this as an industry outsider. Um, um, you know, many of the broad social and economic trends uh, uh, that we highlighted have been written about before. I think we pulled it all together 
uh, in an interesting and coherent and hopefully uh, thought provoking way. Um, but what really struck me was, and this comes out of the survey, uh, was a disconnect between, um, you know, to, to, to use uh, uh, an American colloquialism, uh, between the talk and the walk, right, uh, in, in, in the world of insurance. Um, when insurance, insurance representatives and companies think about financial well-being, they take this holistic, even life cycle approach to it. But when you actually look at what is being prioritized in terms of products and markets, um, there isn't the follow through necessarily that there might be. This is a big challenge for the industry and its relevance in the future. Um, but it, what, what's at stake is the financial well being of future generations, not just the well being of the industry itself. So there, need, there, there, there is this critical synergy here, uh, which, which needs to be um, better developed in the future. Thank you, uh, Richard. I, I hope I get invited back after that. <laughs> um, I'm sure you will. So, um, so let's let's ask the let's repeat the question, and I would request my panelists to keep it very brief, perhaps no more than a minute. So, uh, Tyler, um, what is it that stood out for you uh, most acutely from this report, and what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Thanks, Sajida. That's tough to cover in a minute, but I, I, I said I'll say that I think um, you know the theme that really resonated was just the focus on getting to a place where we're being proactive with preventative measure, measures to to try to manage risk the right way for our consumers and for our customers, and the opportunity to leverage technology in a different way. I think, in in our opinion. Um, which can be solved with engagement is really the, the biggest opportunity that we see in front of us. Lucy, same question to you. Uh, I mean, I, th I, th I think it's a brilliant report. And I think the fact that you've picked up on this notion of the reducing importance of retirement and the increasing importance of different ways of working, phased retirement, unretirement, um, is exactly something that people need to pick up on. And it's exactly as Richard is saying, it is something that people talk too much about. It is not enough that people are doing anything about. So my plea to people here is stop talking and thinking that there's something else for somebody else to sort out. This is something that you can start to influence within your own organization, leaving this webinar today. Thank you very much, Lucy. Lots of, lots of uh, thoughts there, uh, lots of motivation there, I hope as well, to do things and think things differently. Uh, we at the GA will certainly be looking into the space uh, uh, even more in the future years, and I hope uh, we can uh, bring you along with us as we as we explore more of this. With that, let me uh, thank everybody uh, here, our panelists uh, who have given up their time, woken up early in some cases to make this all happen. Thank you, uh, uh, um, Richard, Tyler, and Lucy. Um, but and also, I would like to take make a, a, a special uh, thank you uh, for our, uh, to my co-author uh, Richard and Kai uh, Huveshans, who is my colleague, who is there as an audience uh, but uh, hasn't come onto the the, the webinar. Uh, the, this this work wouldn't have been possible without uh, both of you by my side. So thank you very much, and thank you to our audience. I think we had a fantastic Q and A session, um, and keep those questions coming. Engage with us. There are many ways of doing so. Uh, keep an eye on our website. Join our events. Email us with further questions and. We, we would love to hear from you. With that, I will finish this conference. Thank you, everyone. And as we finish this conference, there will be a short survey uh, to, uh, to send to everybody, and we'll be very, very grateful for your feedback. With that, thank you, and goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>